What is up my friend? How's it going? Welcome to a Let's Play series with your fellow comrade, Summary. Uh, as most of you from my previous channel would know that I do intend to close down that channel. The reason being I want to keep my work profile and my leisure profile, pretty much the YouTube profile, mutually exclusive and I do not wish to mix the two. I hope you all understand. Once again, I apologize for the inconvenience and welcome to the channel a few suggestions that i had received from that previous channel one was to invest in a better mic and i have done so so hope you all enjoy the new and better and improved audio quality another suggestion was to kind of zoom in and show the units a bit more in the battles and i will keep that in mind and uh, i will go ahead and do that in this let's play series uh, and finally, I am actually going to reduce the sizes of my videos that I upload. Two reasons. One, it is easier and quicker to upload videos this way and requires a lot less editing work. So I can get videos out to you guys a bit more frequent and more consistently. And uh, the second reason I'd like to keep the video short is for your viewing pleasure. I do understand one hour videos or so slightly about one hour videos can be uh, can require a lot of investment in terms of time needed to watch the videos. However, without any further ado, let's go ahead and begin this Let's Play series. Uh, in this Let's Play series, we will be playing with the Divide et Impera 1.31 public beta, in which many factions have received major overhauls. However, the biggest overhaul is for none other than the Moria Samraja, also known as the Morian Empire. Speaking of the Mauryan Empire, they are part of the Bharata culture group and as such they get two traits, namely the Tusk Lords which gives minus 10 cost and upkeep for elephant units. Now this is quite useful as the Mauryans have a variety of elephants to choose from and in my opinion uh, the best elephant units in the campaign. And moving on to our next trait, we have Multiculturalism, which gives minus 15 public order penalties due to presence of foreign cultures. The Morians, like any other faction in game, also have three faction specific traits, uh, the standard two buffs and one debuff. Speaking of the buffs, we have Warrior Society that gives increased public order from war and Live by the Sword, which gives increased experience from infantry. And both of these are fairly useful, especially if we choose to fight multiple wars and also I'm not entirely sure if this means increased experience gain for infantry or increased experience upon recruitment. However, we will figure that out once we hop into the campaign. Finally, speaking of our debuff, we do have the Hellenic Mistrust debuff, which gives major diplomatic penalties with all Hellenic factions. This is quite painful, however not so much in the early game as you will see, we are primarily surrounded by Persian factions, with only Bactria further up to the northeast and Seleucids out uh, far out to the west in the uh, Middle East. Uh, however, do, before we jump into the campaign, I'm going to have a quick look at the custom battle menu and have a quick look at the Morian faction roster. And as you can see, they have received a complete overhaul in the 1.31 public beta. As most of you are aware, I am a sub-modder and support modder for the Divide et Impera team. And it is actually myself and a very close friend of mine, Sergeant Neem Swaraj, who are responsible for this Morian overhaul for the 1.31. 1.31. And uh, yeah, without any further ado, let us hop right in and look at our options for the generals. We have the Morian Imperial Infantry. Uh, I usually don't recommend getting infantry for your generals. However, they are the cheapest units, so I will be using them as governor generals. And next up, we have the Morian Bodyguard Cavalry. Uh, it's a fairly good unit. It's uh, got more mobility at a speed of 7. However, uh, when you look at the chariots, uh, which is third unit, uh, Morian armored chariots, they do have a speed of seven also. So it's pretty much a pretty much a toss up between these two options uh, if you're looking for mobility with your general. 
Uh, however, I never recommend chariots for your general as chariots are extremely fragile. However, keep in mind, in my opinion, the chariots are a lot more powerful than elephants when it comes to uh, getting kills. And the reason uh, being is that they have a trample effect, uh, as you can see over here, mighty knockback. And uh, pretty much you can get a lot of kills in really short amount of time. Uh, however, moving on to our final general, we have the Mauryan Royal Elephants. And with the Mauryan Royal Elephants, this is my go-to, my favorite general. They do have a slightly slow speed of 5, but they are incredibly tough and therefore it makes your general extremely hard to kill. So I would always recommend going for the Mauryan Royal Elephants. Moving on to the next section, we have Melee Infantry and we have a plethora to choose from as you can see uh, we start out with some really lightly armored troops however they do have 300 men per unit which is quite helpful and as we upgrade our barracks we get access to more heavily armored and unique infantry in my opinion especially this morian heavy macemen as you can see they have an armor penetration damage of 20, which in my opinion, or if I remember correctly, is the highest armor penetration damage that any unit has in the campaign. Moving on to our next section, we have the spear infantry. Keep in mind, we only have three options to choose from, as this fourth option is actually an AOR unit. And nothing much to see here. Spear units are pretty substandard when it comes to the Morian faction. However, we do have a respectable Morian Armored Spearman right here. And this unit is respectable because it has an armor of 25. And if you scroll over the melee defense, you can see it does have a shield value of 7, which is fairly respectable and it should be able to serve as a decent frontline unit. Moving on to our next section, we have the Missile, uh, missile Infantry. And in the Missile Infantry, we have once again a plethora to choose from and uh, this is one of the categories in which the Morians uh, thrive or shine uh, starting off we have the Indian tribal slingers uh, I would say they are fairly substandard I wouldn't even call them generic as most generic slingers have a range of 190 and uh, these slingers have only 165 so I wouldn't recommend using them at all although they do have 200 men per unit um, 165 is quite low it's actually the median for archer units so it's pretty bad for a slinger unit I would never recommend recruiting this unit um, moving on next we have the javelin uh, Morian skirmishers and they use javelins and uh, a fairly generic javelin unit except uh, for the fact that they are also 200 men strong and they have respectable melee attack and melee defense. Not too great, but respectable. So they can fill a variety of roles such as flanking after they have uh, depleted their ammunition. Moving on to the next unit and this is where the Morians really start to shine. It's the archer units. You have four archers to select from. You have the Indian Levy Longbowmen, Dravidian Mercenaries. Morian Longbowmen and the Reform Longbowmen, which is basically an upgrade of the Morian Longbowmen. Looking at our Indian Levy Longbowmen, I would say they are also fairly generic with the exception of 200 men per unit. They have a slightly above average range of 175. Uh, when we go to the next unit, which is basically the Dravidian Mercenaries, here's where things start to get interesting. As you can see, they have 215 men per unit. Uh, sorry, 215 range in the unit. Um, moving on to our Morian Longbowmen, as you can see, pretty much the same stats. They do have slightly better armor at 8 instead of 1. However, they do have 200 men per unit. And finally, our Morian Reformed Longbowmen. And as you can see, they have the exact same stats as our Morian Longbowmen. However, they do have that armor of 25. Our next two sections pretty much cover cavalry and uh, nothing much to see here. The Morians don't have uh, many options to choose from when it comes to cavalry. However, a few units worth mention are the uh, Gandharan Heavy Cavalry. 
which is pretty much a melee cavalry that can sustain for quite a while in a melee engagement. As you can see, they do have a shield value of 4. And uh, we do have late Indian armored cavalry. Now, these are more like nomadic step type lancer cavalry. And in order to unlock these, we need to unlock the Mauryan reforms, which kind of involves a lot of uh, conquests in the nomadic regions. This unit is kind of inspired from Indian interactions with nomadic tribes that invaded India later on. And when it comes to missile cavalry, nothing much to see. We have a generic light Mauryan cavalry and we also have the Cambodian horsemen. Now, when it comes to the Cambodian horsemen, uh, they're not a purely uh, missile cavalry. They do have only an ammunition of four. However, they do have better armor, half the speed than our light cavalry. And at the same time, they do have respectable melee stats. So they're kind of a hybrid cavalry, you may. Our next section involves chariots. We have two options, the light chariots and the heavy chariots. I won't talk much about the light chariots as I have already mentioned chariots are extremely fragile so I never recommend getting light chariots. However, when it comes to our heavy chariots, these are quite respectable skithered chariots or skythed, I don't know the exact pronunciation. Um, and uh, as most of you have seen my previous uh, let's play with the Bosphorian Kingdom, I didn't get a chance to showcase how powerful chariots can be and so for this campaign I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how I uh, would recommend to use chariots. So hope you all enjoy that. And moving on to our next section we have elephants and once again this is where the Mauryans begin to shine. We have three options starting with the Indian reserve elephant, fairly levy elephant with some javelins. Uh, however, they do have an increased uh, size of 24 men per unit, which is about 50% from the standard 18. Our next unit is the Mauryan War Elephants. Uh, this is where things start to get interesting. They have the same size increment as do all of Mauryan Elephants, about 50% from what is considered standard for the other factions, which is quite nice. Uh, however, the interesting part about this elephant is that it does have an archer unit with a range of 180 and a missile damage of 23. Now why is this interesting? Because this missile damage is insane for an archer type unit as most archers actually have a missile damage of 16 as you can see here and actually it is javelins that have uh, higher missile damage and in fact if you look at a javelin unit it only has a missile damage of 20. This is 23, which is even more than that. And finally, when it comes to our final elephant option, we have the Mauryan Tower Elephants. Now, these elephants are almost as good as the Mauryan Royal Elephants. Keep in mind, they do come with 48 men, both of them, which is 50% uh, more than the standard 36 available to other factions when it comes to very heavy elephants. Uh, pretty much the same stats as your... Uh, Mauryan Royal Elephant. However, it does have slightly less armor at 12 instead of 10 and a base morale of 46 instead of 49. However, just look at that missile damage. 26, that is insane. Last but not least, uh, as far as field artillery is concerned, we do have a Roman uh, or an Indian variant of the Roman catapults, basically the Asfatima. Nothing much to discuss here. Pretty much similar stats. And as most of you know, I do like to employ uh, siege equipment or field artillery for my campaigns as it does help with uh, besieging wall settlements and opens up a new avenue for attack, which I believe to be super helpful, especially um, you know, you're kind of spreading out your efforts between using ladders, burning down the gates and of course creating an opening using our siege equipment. So without any further ado, let us hop right into the campaign and I will see you all in campaign. Alright, so welcome to the campaign. We have an objective, uh, which is basically uh, control nine settlements either by direct ownership or through satrapies and or military allies. I'm going to go ahead and click that off. And the very first thing I like to do is check our characters. So we're going to hop right in. 
uh, as you can see, we are the Mauryan dynasty and it has been founded by Chandragupta Maurya. However, it has been 20 years since he has died and the faction is led by his son and current ruler Bindusara. Now, Bindusara has three sons, basically Shushima, Ashoka the Great and Vitashoka. Uh, speaking of Ashoka, Ashoka the Great, he's a very prominent character in Indian history. Uh, as he is the guy who established the largest empire in the Indian subcontinent uh, throughout history. I mean, bigger than even the Mughal Empire and even bigger than the British Raj. Pretty much encompassed all of present-day Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Afghanistan uh, and Pakistan. And even parts of Iran. Uh, speaking of Shushima, he's actually alive at this stage in the campaign. However, over here, he has been shown uh, as dead. And the reason being is actually after Bindusara, Ashoka became the ruler of the Mauryan faction. Ashoka wasn't favored uh, because his mother was a commoner, whereas Shushima's mother was a princess. And uh, however, a lot of the nobility and court were in favor of Ashoka due to his abilities. So they actually tricked Shushima into a pit of coals and he died a fairly gruesome death. However, for the sake of the campaign, uh, he is dead at the start of the campaign. So an AI faction will have Ashoka as the ruler uh, instead of Shushima. Um, Ashoka is fabled to have killed his 99 half-brothers in order to secure the throne. However, he spared Vitashoka as Vitashoka is actually his blood brother from the same uh, mother who was a commoner. Uh, however, enough waffling, let's move on to the politics. And as you can see, we have uh, three political factions, the Saurashtran court, fairly good party traits. I'm very happy over here. We have the Taxilan families. I would say good family traits, although they hate Greeks. Not much of a problem if you remember, our faction trait is Hellenic mistrust. So. We aren't going to be establishing a lot of diplomatic treaties with Hellenic factions. And finally, we have the uh, Patliputra nobles. Uh, they do have diplomat, which is a fairly neutral trait. And uh, they do have patriot, which gives minus 5 loyalty up to a maximum of minus 20 for every enemy army present on the player's territory. And... Uh, we can pretty much keep this under control as no one will dare to invade our territory or they will face the wrath of Ashoka. Uh, moving on, uh, we do have the provincial empire government type and this is to signify that uh, pretty much the Mauryans are in game up, you know, represented by a small province which is basically a tip of the iceberg to the actual empire size which spanned at this moment pretty much almost all of India. And uh, yeah, so pretty much uh, it is a kind of offshoot of the actual Mauryan faction. And uh, the reason being that they have this province of Maka in the game is actually Chandragupta Maurya fought a war against Seleucus uh, Nikator. Uh, the last of the remaining Diadochi and uh, uh, basically he won that war and as part of the peace treaty he was offered the province of uh, Maka Gedrosia. Uh, speaking of our government types and how we would like to be, our current influence is overlooked which is pretty bad. want to move all the way up to Beloved. As you can see, uh, Beloved is that sweet spot after which uh, we will get Exalted, which gives a minus three uh, tax debuff. So we want to stay at around Beloved, which is uh, between 70 to 75% in terms of influence. Currently, we are at 35%. So we'd like to change that as quickly as we can. And I will be showing you all in this campaign how to do so. Alright, without any further ado, let's have a quick look at our strategic map. As you can see, we have several uh, options to expand. Uh, in fact, we have three options. We can expand into our neighbors Asagarta or into our northern neighbors Ranka. And as a third option, we can 
paid Arabia. However, I'm going to stay away from Arabia as it is a pain to deal with due to that attrition. And it's really a massive distance to cover. Like, let's say we invade and take over Muscat. Marching all the way towards uh, Marib is going to take a long time. And then finally down towards uh, Udemon. So, not really profitable, I would say. Especially in the early game when it takes a lot of time for your armies to move around. So we are pretty much going to focus on these two uh, neighboring factions. However, both of them, if we look at the diplomatic map, both of them are satrapies of the Seleucids. So declaring war against them will call the Seleucids and all of his vassals in a war against us. So I really don't want to do that. However, in Deverea Tempera, the Seleucid uh, satrapies do get uh, a chance to rebel and declare war on their former overlords. And this is Divide at Impera after all. So I will be using um, that opportunity to play each faction one against the other. And pick our opportune moment to strike each faction. Before we go ahead and begin some of the province management. I am going to take a quick look at the technology. I'm going to get this organized supply as it gives a minus one upkeep cost for all armies. As well as I'm going to rush towards the uh, signaling, which gives a, another minus three upkeep cost for all armies. So let's go ahead and do that. And the reason being is because when we look at our finances, as you can see, uh, we have uh, two major expenditures. Uh, basically the army upkeep and the naval upkeep. So uh, any upkeep cost reduction is significantly going to help improve our army. Currently, uh, our economy, sorry. Currently, we have an army. I'm going to go ahead quickly, rename it to Sena, which means army. I'm not sure. Yep. And it's currently headed by our faction leader, Bindusara. He's got a chariot. However, Bindusara is 50 years of age. He should die fairly quickly. And Ashoka should be the faction ruler for pretty much most of the campaign. He's fairly young at 22. So I'm going to go ahead, replace him. I'm not going to go for the chariots as I had explained earlier. It's fairly uh, fragile. And I'm going to go with my favorite option, the Morian Royal Elephants. Uh, apart from that, we can expand our settlement. So we are going to go ahead and expand it. And we're going to opt for the war animal stalls. Uh, in this 1.31 public beta, the Morians have been given three recruitment buildings, namely the Levy Camp, which upgrades into your infantry quarters, through which you can hire all your infantry type units. Uh, the second option is the War Animal Stalls, which gives you access to your cavalry and elephant units. And finally, we have the Chariot Factory, which uh, gives you access to both your chariots and siege equipment or field artillery rather so yeah we will go ahead and build that war animal stalls meanwhile we can also upgrade <coughs> these uh, settlements and the building over here we are on the fence when it comes to food so i'm gonna go ahead and get a fishing boat also i will upgrade our main settlement building I am not going to upgrade the Eastern City Center. Instead, I am going to dismantle it. Uh, because for most of you who have seen my economic guide, uh, Pura has Spice as a resource. And Spice is uh, rated an S tier according to my economic guide on the TW forums. Or as you can see in Toxburg's video channel uh, or YouTube channel. And so I'm going to go ahead and build that Spice building order to promote my economy finally i am going to recruit some units uh, pretty much going to start out with the cheapest units uh, so that you know i can squeeze out that extra bit of income per turn uh, because if i do hire the more expensive units first then every turn that upkeep cost is going to make it significantly harder to do much else so i do recommend hiring the cheapest unit to upgrade Finally, let's look at our diplomacy. We are going to try to establish some trade agreements with Muscat. 
Unfortunately, they won't agree. So nothing much we can do there. Lastly, we are going to recruit a uh, governor general to improve our economy and public order. We do have uh, Tar Hadon of the Shalrastran court. It does have plus three public order. Very useful. And then we have Gaubaruva. Not really a governor general. However, we will be using him as such. And finally, we have Basha. Minus 60 public orders due to local presence of foreign cultures. Quite useful. So, he's also a good option. However, we are going to go for Isar Hedon first. Going to go ahead, select him. And we are going to select the cheapest option, which is the Mauryan Imperial Infantry. Going to go ahead, pop him in the city. And rename him to Mantri. Basically means governor or uh, advisor. And name it after the city. Raya. There we go. <laughs> the last thing we can do is actually hire some agents. So we're going to go ahead and... Ideally, we would have liked to have some cultural conversion agents. However, we don't have that option. As you can see, the culture in the province of Maka is primarily Persian at 70%. And only 30% Hinduism, so we do need to convert that culture as quickly as we can. However, we can't do so. So I'm going to go ahead and get this guy who gives that public order and growth rate. And uh, he's going to be the governor that pretty much moves around the campaign trying to culture convert newly acquired uh, territory. And I am also going to hire a second uh, dignitary. Plus growth uh, yeah, plus one growth per turn and plus five wealth from commerce buildings. Yep. And lastly, we can also get a spy. So, what options do we have here? Not really a fan of the upkeep cost as my spies don't really accompany an army. Instead, I am going to go for the spy that has more campaign movement. And with that, I guess we can go ahead and end the turn. And it will take a while for me to completely build up this army. So I am going to fast forward into the future. And I will see you all in the future when I am either ready to attack Asagartha. Or move up this way and attack Stranka and take over Maka. So see you all in the future when I am ready to do either of the actions. Alright, so welcome back to the future. Uh, we have uh, proceeded many turns ahead. And as you can see, I have marched Ashoka all the way up north through this uh, pass uh, in order to avoid that desert attrition. And we are just about to attack uh, Thrada and declare war on Sranka. Uh, the diplomatic situation in the east over here is that pretty much all the uh, satrapies of the Seleucids have rebelled against the Seleucids. So he's pretty much at war with everyone, with the exception of Parsa. And Parsa has taken over Bam and are currently besieging uh, Harmosia. So I don't think it's going all too well for the Asagartha. Meanwhile, uh, they have left Bam kind of undefended, which has provoked uh, Zranka to march their armies out. That should just give us about enough time for our army under Ashoka to kind of uh, steal the city from them and put them into a form of attrition. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And uh, we have completed our signaling research. So the very next thing I am going to do is physical conditioning, which gives us access to stable complex which is the upgrade to our war animal stables. As you can see, this upgrade gives us access to the Morian Tower Elephants, which are as good as the Morian Royal Elephants, so that's fairly useful. Apart from that, our two Governor Generals, uh, our two Governor Generals are basically um, leveled up, so we have opted for that Public Order bonus with Rightful Sovereign and capable bureaucrat 
However, this guy over here hasn't yet leveled up. I have hired another governor general, basically Basha, as Mantri One Pura. Meanwhile, our diplomats have also leveled up, so I have focused on that cultural conversion. As you can see, we are almost um, slowly inching our way towards a new uh, majority cu uh, culture in the province of Maka. <clears throat> and pretty much we have the uh, same build over here for this other governor. Meanwhile, our spy is near to Frada. I have leveled him up for that assassination attempt chance as you will see it's super useful especially against uh, enemies that don't have any settlements left if we assassinate the faction leader that pretty much wipes out any remaining army so the hope is we are going to attack with uh, Ashoka take over Frada and then use the spy to attack their faction leader who is pretty much uh, this guy over here Tiridates so yeah Hopefully he will die from the assassination attempt and we won't have to deal with these two stacks over here. However, have to, have to absolutely deal with them. I do believe we can manage, although they do have superior infantry. As you can see here, we have two elephant units and three if you count the general unit. However, we do have fairly low tier spearmen units that can hold the line fairly well. Uh, we do have a cavalry advantage as well, so I'm not too concerned about that army. However, it can be an issue because as you can see, they pretty much are almost double our size, so I'm going to have to watch out for that. However, without any further ado, I'm going to go hop right into this battle. And after this battle, I will most likely end this video. As I did mention earlier, I want to keep our videos as short and sweet as possible. And not, uh, you know, upload one hour videos for the several reasons I outlined earlier in this uh, video. Anyways, we're going to go ahead, open we our diplomacy with the Seleucids. Therefore, and offer to join to war point. against Stranka. There we go. Moderate, perhaps he will pay us. He's rejected. So the other option is to take Barsa. Farsa won't. Uh, we can't actually initiate any diplomatic uh, ties with Farsa. So, the next option is actually <laughs> to directly declare war on Stranka ourselves. They aren't really allied to anyone, so we can do that. However, I'm going to attempt one more thing with the Seleucids. The that is to join war Speak, against Franca. Offer a payment. Or so cases. it should be kind of less. And then demand instead. Still refusing. Join war against Stranka. Come on. Do not try to buy our How about favor? a little bit of not money? Roman not too much. Whores. Still rejecting. I will listen Join war against Ranka without any payment. Okay, they have accepted. Excellent. Has improved our relationship with them, so that's always helpful. And with that, we are going to go ahead and attack Stranka. And I will see you all in the battle. Welcome to the battle. We're going to begin our deployment. And before we begin our deployment, we're just going to have... Where's the sun in that direction? So we're just going to have a quick look at all the units as promised. Just going to spread them out right there so that we can quickly inspect the units. And I will actually tell you uh, all the units and assets that I have personally modded into the game. And hopefully you all enjoy changes to the Morian faction. So starting off, we will start with our spearmen. And with the Morian Spearman, uh, as you can see, really beautiful looking unit. I uh, haven't really done much here, except for the fact that I have uh, included these bamboo type spears uh, to keep them kind of like in line with the Indian kind of look. And uh, next on, we'll move to our archers. And when it comes to the archers, I haven't really done much, although Sergeant Meem Suraj has made this asset right here, this lovely cross belt, that small disc plate in the center 
apart from that, I do believe I have also designed the quiver models. Where are they? Yes, the ones here in the back, as you can see. Uh, fairly standard leather quiver models. Moving on to our next unit, we have the Morian Light Cavalry. Once again, I haven't really done much here apart from the bamboo spears and uh, also the quivers. So, and keep in mind, most of these assets are a collaboration between myself and Sergeant Meem Suraj, while he pretty much designed the geometry of these uh, models. I have pretty much designed the textures. Next up, we will move to our Morian Macemen. And as you can see, I have designed these spell cuirasses. There are four variants, namely the bronze variant, as the one you are seeing right here. You have the silver variant. There is also an iron variant right here. So you can tell the difference between silver and iron side by side. And we also have a brass variant, which is different from the bronze variant over here in this guy in the back. Can't really mark that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, another thing I did design was this waistband, pretty much the leather variant over here, and there is also a cloth variant right here. Uh, Sergeant Meme Swaraj, meanwhile, has uh, kind of amended that mace texture, quite looking quite a lot better than what it formerly was. Apart from that, we also designed uh, this dhoti, which is pretty much an Indian skirt, uh, worn by farmers. <clears throat> Next up, we are going to move to our light elephant unit. Have I spread them out somewhere? Right over here. And some of the things I did uh, mod into the game were these blanket designs, as you can see over here. Uh, here, this design right here. And apart from that, I did add some skin decals, as you can see over here. And lovely skin decal, as well as this one, inspired by the Shiva... Uh, no, Shiva sign on the forehead, and my favorite was being this this skin design right here. I really really like this design. It's from a personal inspiration that I have done, and I have added the uh, historic Pali script onto the thing, and of course the standard Shiva logo on the forehead. And finally, we move on to our Morian Royal Elephants. And now this is the cream of all my texturing that I have done. As you can see, pretty much everything about this cavalry, uh, about this elephant unit, I and Sergeant Meme Swaraj has modded into the game. As you can, as for most of you who have played with the Morian faction, this elephant was fairly bland. It was just a blend of grey and white, not really standing out. But as you can see over here, it looks fabulous with all that head armor colored really colorful the armor itself which is a combination of bronze and colors as well as the towers as you can see you know, we do have that lotus engraving the steel uh, or iron pillars and gold engravings on those pillars as well as the gold nails and of course the uh, canopies on top have been modded as well Anyhow, since I have shown you all the units, let's go ahead and quickly deploy our army. We're going to go ahead, as usual, mark our general as our first unit. I am going to release a guide for how I use units individually. And in that guide, I will explain a lot about each unit and how I believe they kind of should be used. I'm going to go ahead and actually pull out our entire army here so that we can have a clear look of what's going on here. Set up our archers over there. Toggle on guard mode so that they don't uh, charge further into melee. Next up, we're going to move our spearmen front as a frontline unit. Okay. Alright. Put our archers in slightly closer. Right, we're going to keep our basemen as an infantry reserve. And finally, we're going to set up our elephants on flank. And behind them, we're going to have our cavalry units. Now, one of the things you notice is that I am locking our elephant formation. 
And the reason being is I don't like to spread out elephants as most players do. And that is for several reasons. One is it's really hard to maneuver as you can see, you know, they really take a long time to turn around. Whereas uh, in a narrower formation, they are a lot more maneuverable. Uh, however, you don't want to make it too narrow as you pretty much end up with the same issue. And in my experience, 5 uh, units per row is ideal. And uh, the reason being for several reasons, it does give the maximum charge bonus. Let's say we are using this elephant unit to charge into that archer unit over there. So they will move fairly well and charge directly that armor unit. Uh, sorry, that archer unit. However, if we do spread them thin, as they move, they will interfere with this unit and uh, they will get bogged down. And when they do get bogged down, they lose their charge bonus because they were actually intended to charge this unit and not this unit over here. So that's one of the reasons I like to keep elephants a bit narrow. We're going to go ahead and do that. Put our cavalry on the right flank to this right behind them and our general further out to the right all right so without any further ado gonna go ahead start the battle gonna select the entire army and hold down the control key while moving so that they move in a marched formation quickly gonna quick forward the reason i do this is so that they stay fairly in formation and that their stamina stays at fresh uh, we don't want them to get exhausted as, you know, that incurs severe penalties to their melee stats and other stats. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it actually reduces all stats by 50%. Of course, uh, not things like armor, for example, but it does reduce melee attack, melee defense, so forth. So, yeah. And another thing I would like to do also select my main frontline unit and lock the group as well as the archer unit and lock the group and the reason being is because if I want to reorient my main line all I have to do is hold down control hit the left and right arrow keys and as you can see they move or rotate as a unit to the left or to the right as so so that's quite useful if you need to do that little bit of adjustment in order to you know, perfect that front line to face the enemy appropriately. We are going to move up a little bit further into range and initiate the battle. As you can see the battle has initiated so I am going to slow down the speed. <clears throat> so I want to select my archers and micromanage uh, who I want to attack. And I will attack their archers. They do have just three archer units. So we should be able to deal with them fairly easily. And in order to see which, where your archers are firing. You can hold down the space key. And as you can see you are properly micromanaged. In the meanwhile I do want to move out our cavalry further to the flanks. In preparation for that eventual uh, cycle charge on the rear. Let's have a look here. Okay. Seems the enemy is ready to commit their melee troops into the engagement. So really quickly I'm going to try to micromanage uh, our counter charge. Although our spear units don't have really that great of a charge. I do want to micro that so that you know, I get whatever bonus I can. Great. I have charged that unit, meanwhile this unit can charge this one, this one can charge this unit straight up ahead, and this unit can charge up here, meanwhile our archers can shoot at this general, all of them can shoot here, quickly charge this unit, and get that charge off, and I am going to move our cavalry on the left flank to engage this general over here. Meanwhile, our elephants are going closer to rear charge. I'm going to do the same with the elephants on left flank. Okay, great.
But as you can see, pretty much their front line is already routing, so that's good for us. Hopefully I will be able to get an elephant charge off. I think this elephant is in, is in position, so we're going to go ahead, charge, have a quick look at that. They should make fairly quick work of this unit. And there we go. Yeah, crazy amount of uh, damage right there, and the unit is already routing. Meanwhile, I can use my general to charge over here. And this final elephant unit can charge here. We're gonna switch off our archers to prevent that friendly fire. Have a quick look at our general. Brilliant stuff. He's already routed this unit. So he is going to move up here and try to charge into this unit over here. So there ahead we go. We are charging this unit right over here. And with that we have ended the battle and won quite decisively I would say. So I will see you all in the campaign. As you can see, very decisive victory. Only 116 losses. Alright, and with that we have taken over our first settlement, Prada. And the culture is Persian, so I am going to go ahead and the settlement, although that might create some public order issues in our province. We are at uh, zero public order, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. I am going to go ahead and go get some gold in there. And we can go ahead and repair all the buildings and build our copper mine. Meanwhile, I am going to disband this barracks once this is prepared. Since I want to focus all our economic uh, development in Pura. Uh, since uh, I don't have a lot of provinces, in fact I only have one province right here, Maka. Uh, the only thing I can do is kind of uh, spread out the purpose of this province to kind of fulfill all roles such as food generation, recruitment and economy. However, once I do manage to get more provinces, I will specialize and show you how I specialize the provinces. Alright, uh, so with that, I think I can end the video, but before that, I am going to attempt an assassination. Hopefully I succeed. And I wasn't able to succeed, so this army is pretty much going to try to make its way. Thankfully, it's going to take a couple of turns to reach us, as it cannot reach us in the first turn due to this river kind of being in the way. So that's great. It should take a bit of attrition. And uh, that should help us replenish our army to full. And I will see you all in the next video. Anyways, uh, thank you all for watching. Hope you all enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're interested in more such videos. Peace and love.